I was in a very successful movie called Heaven Can Wait. Uh, it it uh, opened uh, 76, 1977, and uh, just it was critically acclaimed. It made a lot of money, and as a result of being in that movie, uh, I became uh, in demand in the movies, uh, particularly in demand. Uh, and I was offered all kinds of things. And one of the things that I was uh, offered was uh, Paramount Pictures had... Uh, had bought the title of the uh, the sex manual, The Joy of Sex. It had all these photographs of, or drawings, I think it was, of people having sex. And uh, and they had bought this title, and they were going to make a movie out of it. Uh, well, you know, the, the manual, the uh, the illustrations of people having sex really wasn't a movie, but they, they thought that the title, the commercial title, Joy of Sex, was, a, was really a, a valuable item and they, they bought this and they had commissioned various people to make a movie and call it Joy of Sex and after about four or five people uh, did this and it didn't satisfy them somehow they got around to me and someone from Paramount Pictures called me and said uh, we'd like you to make a movie and we've got this title Joy, Joy of Sex I know I don't I, I, I can't I don't know and I said no and they called back and they called back a third time at that time I was so flattered by I hadn't been used to that kind of attention and I said well I have an idea, and if, 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 uh, if the people of Paramount are interested in this idea, maybe uh, th then I would write this. And the, the idea that I had was that, um, that there, this would be a movie about a movie studio that bought a title of a best-selling sex book called Joy of Sex, and then they didn't know what to do with the title. I wanted to make a movie about the reality of what was happening to Paramount Pictures. And I went in and I spoke to Michael Eisner, who now runs Disney and owns ABC and all these things and it had been a kind of a supporter and benefactor of mine throughout my movie career and I told him this story about the movie studio that bought the best-selling sex manual title Joy of Sex and uh, then they didn't know what to do with it and the other idea I had as part of this movie was that I got from reading a magazine uh, article about Robert Evans who at that time was a big mogul in Hollywood and said that he had this and he had that and he had made this movie and The Godfather and Rosemary's Baby and all of these things and he had a mansion he was always with the most beautiful women and at the end of the article it said that Robert Evans conducted this interview uh, confined to his bed with a chronic back condition and and for me that was kind of the story of what I observed in the movie business there were a lot of people who were doing things that they didn't quite know what they were doing and also there was a lot of uh, back problems among other kinds of physical problems. So that was what the movie was. I was uh, about uh, these people that got sick uh, working trying to make a movie about sex or love or something with joy of sex and none of it was going anywhere. And they liked it. And Michael Eisner and the other people sitting at that meeting, they liked it. They thought it was funny and they not only hired me to, um, to write the movie, but they agreed that I would write the movie, I would star in the movie, and I would direct the movie. I was coming out of a hit movie, Heaven Can Wait. So I wrote the movie, and um, I thought it turned out pretty well. And uh, then the head of production at that time, a man named Don Simpson, who hadn't been at the original meeting, read the script. He was out sick. He hadn't been at the original meeting. And his comment was, everybody gets sick in this movie. Don, having been out sick, <laughs> came back for that comment. And it was, it, was, um, it, was out. it was what they call turnaround. They didn't want to do it. You turn around and get out of here with this movie. We don't want to do it. He felt as though it attacked the movie industry. It attacked all of them. And who wants to see something about everybody getting sick? That began a, a nine-year saga as I went out and tried to get this movie made. It really was a movie. I should have just let it go right there. It was, a, it was too inside Hollywood. It was too subjective. It, I wasn't experienced enough to know that I should have just let it go then. I just was determined to get it made. So for nine years, I went around, and, and first MGM called. Dave Beagleman, who ran MGM, read the movie and really liked it a lot and said, if we can make this movie for under $8 million, uh, we'll make it. And they did a budget, and it cost $7 million, so they were going to make it. Then another man at MGM read the movie says, we don't want to make this movie. This movie attacks all of us. It makes us look like we don't know what we're doing. But you've got the movie set up with Charles Grodin, or the, uh, the meeting set up, so I came in for this meeting. And in the course of the meeting, they attacked the script that they were supposedly going to make and uh, ended up saying, all right, we'll give you $5 million, not $8 million. I said, oh, you said $8 million, and I left. I turned on the $5 million to make this movie. 
Then I would go around, this is a, a nine year period, I read the script to different people who ran studios. I actually was in a position to get the people's office and houses at night. I would go there and read them this script. And one, one man um, I read it to, uh, uh, Ned Tannen, who was the head of uh, Universal at the time, uh, the lead character in this, the head of a studio, has a heart attack. <laughs> and Ned Tannen that was the head of a studio who had had a heart attack. I realized that in the middle of the reading, that I'm, I'm reading it to a guy who actually had the experience of the character in this movie. And there weren't many laughs from Ned as I was, uh, as I was reading the, uh, the script. And that, that didn't work out. Another time I read it to an a independent, so to uh, independent financial sources. And they loved it. And they said, we're going to make this movie. And then two weeks later, uh, they weren't. And I called them and I said, I thought you said you were going to make this movie. And they said, well, you know, when we said we're going to make the movie, that doesn't mean we're going to make the movie. I said, does not He said, no, we're going to make it if Warner Brothers likes it, if, uh, if, 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 if. So I, was, I, I, I went on. At one point, there was a man named Frank Yablons, and I went to his house. He was an independent producer, and uh, he kind of fell asleep in the middle of me reading this movie which later ended up to be called, it was called Joy of Sex, and then Dreamers, and then released as Movers and Shakers. And Frank fell asleep, but at the end, he seemed to wake up and he seemed to like it. But nothing much came of that either. He liked it, but it didn't really, it didn't, you know. A few years went by, again, we're talking about uh, 1976 till finally it was made in 1985 when Frankie Blondes became the head of MGM. And I went over there and he agreed to make it for two and a half million dollars because at that point I had gotten my friends Steve Martin, Gilda Radner, Penny Marshall, Tyne Daly was in it, Bill Macy was in it, ultimately when we made it uh, Walter Matthau was in it. We had an all-star cast, everyone but Walter Matthau working for nothing and that was okay because they all came in with me and Walter Matthau came in came in later and we made the movie and it was a very inside movie as I've said and the, the head of uh, well, I guess a guy involved in distribution, when he saw the movie, his advice to me was to burn the movie, burn the print, because nobody's going to want to book this movie. It's too inside. It's a home movie. You should have thought of that when you make it. And he said, burn the print. Worse than that, the studio tried to get out of paying the bank. It's something called a negative pickup. The bank pays us the $2.5 million, and the studio tried to get out of paying the bank. Just get out of it because they didn't think they were going to do very much with this movie and then they came around and they decided once they saw it frankie blonde saw the movie and decided we won't get into a lawsuit he will release it he actually did like it and the movie was released and it uh it got a 10 from gary franklin who gives this rating system out in los angeles it got a review from joel siegel that said you'll laugh till you'll cry it also got a review from a local critic in los angeles said who said if you want to uh, know what it's like to die sitting upright in a theater seat, go see this, this movie. Um, I tell you this whole story because we're talking about depression tonight, and at that point, I went into a depression. This was depressing. Nine years of effort, and uh, someone says, if you want to know what it feels like to die, <laughs> go watch this movie. You know, it was a subjective experience, an inside, behind-the-scenes Hollywood movie. Movers and Shakers. But I had gotten to a point there where um, I wasn't on, I didn't take medication. I was just down. I didn't want to do anything. I was depressed. I just kind of like, I, I, I continued to act as though I was okay, but I wasn't okay. I was, it was also around the time that my father had died. When, when I was the same age, my father had died. I had just turned 50. And a lot of, uh, events coincided that I was, uh, it was the, for the third time in my life, I would say I was really depressed. 17 million people in this country are considered to be clinically depressed. Two-thirds of them are women, and a quarter of them attempt suicide. A half of them are not properly diagnosed. 15% of untreated people do kill themselves. Therapy and medication is successful 80 or 90% of the time. Over a period of four to six weeks, if you're really depressed, 80 to 90 percent of the time you can get out of this with therapy or medication it can be a chemical imbalance in your body which was not what i experienced or it can just be circumstance which it was what i experienced and now i know if ever i get down i just got to keep going ahead even though i don't want to do anything i don't want to i don't feel like doing anything that's when the time you have to just do it do it because you can feel better things can change things do get better and most people will kill themselves because they don't believe 
this feeling of hopelessness will ever change. Tonight, we're going to have the great actor uh, Rod Steiger join us, who has uh, suffered serious depression. Kathy Conkri Con Cronkite, who is the daughter of Walter Cronkite, who is the author of On the Edge of Darkness, who has suffered depression much of her adult life. Dr. Douglas Jacobs from Harvard Medical School will join us, and we'll try to get some insight into depression. And later, we'll be joined by the most amazing woman, Camille Giraldi, who's written a book called Camille's Children. She has uh, over 40 children who are devastatingly afflicted. Down syndrome, partial brains, colostomies. Every affliction you can imagine, she has all these children living with her. An amazing story. Uh, we'll go to a break and we'll hear what some men on the street, women on the street, people on the street in New York City have to say about depression, and we'll be back and see if we can learn something from this show, because I know there are people out there watching right now who are depressed, and I think you can learn something about what do we do about depression. Be right back. I knew I suffered from depression all, all my life, but I always denied it because uh, growing up, it was the kind of experience where uh, if you were sad or you were depressed, you got beat for it. You know, you were told that you're all no good and you're stupid and I'll give you something to cry about. So I always repressed it and hid it and I became a clown, the class clown, and I acted out and just acted funny whenever I was depressed. So I never told everybody, but I would say in my early 40s is when I actually began to finally seek help. and. Now the medication is helping an awful lot. No matter how depressed and down on whatever's going on in your life, unfortunately there's always somebody else that's even more down and strung out than you are, you know, and uh, there's just, there's, there is always a brighter day that you got to keep looking forward to. I think the best thing to do is start, stop thinking about yourself and think about other people. I just work it out on something. I think you need some type of area to, like, express yourself. If it's chronic, I think they should probably have some uh, professional help. But short of that, I think physical exercise is an excellent way to deal with depression. In the middle of it, it was impossible to get out of it. You just sink lower and lower. But uh, I found out that the older you, I get is the only way to get out of it, just to think how much worse it can be and how actually it silly is. Just get out of it, snap out of it. 17 million Americans suffer from clinical depression and many of them do not receive diagnosis or treatment. Joining me to talk about depression is Academy Award winning actor Rod Steiger who became depressed following heart surgery in the 1980s. He's in our Burbank studio in Austin, Texas. Is Kathy Cronkite, daughter of anchorman Walter Cronkite. Kathy suffers from depression and has interviewed people affected by depression for her book, On the Edge of Darkness. Joining us from Boston is Dr. Douglas Jacobs, an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and an expert on depression and suicide. Uh, uh, Rod Steiger, um, exercise wouldn't have helped you after your heart surgery, would it have? Well, no, that's because there's a misunderstanding. I am not a medical expert at all, but the point is there's a thing, I call them social depressions. You lose someone you love, your mother or somebody to death or a family, you get depressed, it may take you four months or a year to get out of it. Clinical depression is a chemical imbalance of the brain and the commutative apparatus of the brain, and it's, I always talk to it, uh, it's like having we have to take insulin, diabetes every day. I have to take my medicine in the morning or at night if I like it or not. And when you're affected that way with the chemical influence of the brain, it has nothing to do with pulling yourself together or bootstraps or what have you. It's, mm -hmm. You are the victim of a disease. Mm -hmm. And this struck you after your heart surgery, Rod? Did you experience after any of this? A while, I think it came from that. I have a whole theory I'm trying to verify, and that is I think you have to be very careful with anesthesia because if you don't, for some people, it can uh, disrupt their uh, mental condition or their brain working. I talked to a man who's the head of chief neurosurgeon at a Montreal hospital and I said to him, listen, if I put something in your body and being, and it's so powerful you can cut me to pieces, when it goes away, how do I know all the pieces have lined up? And I'll never forget, he put his fingers to his lips and he said, Mm. We don't like to talk about that too much, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's, the, I think the medical world's been kind of quiet about that, but I don't think it applies to all, all people. But I'm convinced you know, certain powerful sedatives and things like that can affect you. And then the other thing, of course, which is just a very simple thing I wanted to say, is you cannot drink and take an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. You can't say, well, I'll cut it down to one glass of wine. No. Mm -hmm. I was drinking for years, taking antidepressants, and all these so-called experts said nothing. Until mm -hmm. one finally, who was a psychopharmacologist, said, no, no. Psycho, he knows as a doctor, he knows the chemical instruments of the body and the brain. And that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. So it's funny how a simple thing like that took me years to discover. Dr. Jacobs, you know, it strikes me what Rod Steiger says. There's so many things that should be obvious to people but aren't. For example, you cannot drink and take anti do What, you want to comment on what, uh, what Rod has said? Well, there are a number of things. First of all, I think Mr. Steiger may go a wonderful doctor because he gives a lot of good advice. Uh, first of all, about interaction of uh, medications and... Uh, uh, alcohol or any other substances is very important if anyone is taking an antidepressant to not take any other medication uh, unless their doctor approves of it and particularly to drink because what what drinking can do is it sir drinking can make depression worse and it can make the antidepressant less effective but there are a couple of points that that mr steiger mentions that i think is critical to depression first of all the triggers of depression which can be a severe loss you know, in your own case, Mr. Grodin, you talk about uh, a shattered dream, a severe disappointment. People who have depression have shattered dreams, severe losses. Fortunately, it doesn't work the other way around, that just because someone loses somebody doesn't mean they're going to develop depression. A distinction that I like to make is the difference between feeling sad and bad, that people who lose a loved one who have a shattered dream may feel sad, may feel disappointment but they don't necessarily feel bad about themselves. It doesn't affect their entire body. It doesn't slow them down. It doesn't affect their sleep or appetite or the way they feel about themselves. They don't feel worthless or useless when they've lost a loved one. And it's important to think about that distinction. And that treatment for the majority of people is a combination of medication and therapy. Some people may need to remain on the medication for a long period of time. Some people can go off it after six months to a year. But the point is that if someone experiences a loss, if someone has a physical setback, such as uh, Mr. Steiger, a heart attack is obviously a very severe uh, illness and change in one's life, and, and their feelings persist, the feelings of uh, sadness, but also the way they think if their concentration is impaired, if they have difficulty making uh, decisions, if the joy has gone out of life, if they lose interest in things. These psychological symptoms, people don't tend to associate with depression. They may look for more classical signs, which, which are disturbances in sleep and appetite and energy level. And the most serious psychological symptom is thoughts of death or suicide and anybody watching this show or at any other time if they have a thought of suicide they should consult a health care professional immediately it is not a normal reaction to any kind of disappointment or loss of a loved one kathy like to, kathy cronkreich go please thank you i would like to mention too that one of the differences that i like to point out between uh the kind of sadness or depression with a small d that you have after a loss or a disappointment or even an illness, usually you turn to other people. You reach out to other people for comfort or for company or to help you get, get through it. But with depression, we most often turn inward. We isolate ourselves. We remove ourselves from the company of other people and, uh, and, and, and turn it against ourselves. And that's a big difference and a noticeable difference between a sort of a uh, healthy response to a loss or a disappointment and a, and a depressed person's response. Kathy, Kathy, when did you first start to experience these kind of feelings? Well, I can look back now and, and see it back when I was just entering puberty, around 12 or 13 years old. And uh, it raises another point, which is what is the trigger to a depression? There can be no trigger at all. Someone can go into a depression without, quote, a reason, without a death or a loss. Sometimes changing hormones can trigger a depression, as in entering puberty, or as in postpartum depression, or as in menopausal depression, and some of these other um, hormonal rites of passages. To someone who has an, already has a vulnerability to depression, that can be the trigger to, to the illness. Okay, you, I, I know that when you, were, uh, when you were a child, many people thought you were depressed because you had a famous father and you had to deal with that. I mean, I would that it were that simple. We're, we'll go to a break and I'll be right back with my guests.
Doctor, uh, what, what are anxiety attacks? Uh, anxiety attacks are uh, are feelings of uh, excessive um, nervousness. Sort of nervousness, uh, where you, where your heart is palpitating, uh, beating real fast, where you uh, may over breathe, where you may have a sensation that you're going to get dizzy. And then the worst kind of anxiety attack is what we call a panic attack, in which someone has a sense of impending doom, that they're going to die, and that's frequently, it can get misdiagnosed as a heart attack. About 70% of people who have depression will have anxiety attacks. It's not unusual. It's a, it's a very uncomfortable uh, symptom to have. Uh, doesn't it, it sometimes have to do, excuse me, doesn't it have to do with uh, if you're not actually experiencing what's really working on your subconscious, that you're upset, you're angry about something, and you don't know it, and you're just repressing things? Can't that sometimes cause hyperventilating? Well, it's sort of the distinction between sort of what's the difference between fear and anxiety. I mean, anxiety is not necessarily all bad, that we have anxiety when we prepare for things, uh, students in preparation for exams. Uh, it all feels bad, though, doesn't it, doctor? Oh, well, it depends upon the level. That, that uh, uh, any amount of anxiety, I suppose you could say, feels bad, but certainly there is a certain degree in which your body can't tolerate and you feel uh, that you need to basically take a, take a break. And one of the unfortunate things, and that's uh, addressing what Mr. Steiger said earlier about alcohol, people can miss, miss uh, signal anxiety and they feel, well, the way to deal with it is to drink because uh, alcohol initially is a, uh, will uh, reduce anxiety. Now, can we, we, excuse yeah. me, Doc, we have to go to a break. We'll, we'll be right back and we'll talk about what do we do about all of this. We'll be right back. I get depressed, yes, and when I get depressed, I try to think about something good that's coming up in my life to get me out of it. I've got a great support group, a lot of friends that I can talk to if I really need some, you know, just somebody to listen often helps with depression. Typically what I do is go to my support group, my mother and my sister, I go to the gym and work out, relieve stress, um, that's about it, try to figure out where it's coming from. Rod, did you ever imagine when you were coming up and you're this brilliant actor and having all the success in the world, did you ever imagine you'd have to go through what you've gone through in life? Did it ever enter your mind? No, I was, uh, I was on my own when I was about nine. Not a group. I, I have a thing I call our, uh, environmental, which means I, I, I didn't pay attention. I lived one minute at a time. But the thing that happens is no matter who you are, you always think you're the chosen one. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have the guts to get up in the morning, and then one day you find out when they're wheeling you down the hall or something, or giving you going to a depressive state, that uh, you're not, and you've got a big problem. The only thing I'd like to correct is I did not have a heart attack. I had the clogging of veins, and that's very important because of my profession. Right. I would but, like to, to respond a little bit to what several of the people that you've spoken to on the street have said yes. about how they get themselves out of a depression. This is an easier way of getting I mean, these These are not severe depressions we're hearing from on no, the street. No, exactly. They're not severe depressions, and there's some wonderful advice in there, but it's important to understand that there's also a level of disability with depression where you really cannot get up out of bed. You cannot go out and do something for somebody else or snap yourself right, out of it right. or pull yourself up. And to, to tell someone to is like telling someone in a wheelchair, just get up and walk. Right. Well, this yeah, would not apply if you're dealing with chemical imbalance. Rod, you wanted to say, wouldn't apply well, if you're dealing exactly with the kind was, of... That's exactly what I was going to say. The, 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 the only thing in such a short time I can talk about is I know that isolation is the beginning of the end and you're going to kill yourself and you've got to keep moving. I have two two cars in my family. One says keep moving, the other says courage. And after 71 years, that's about all I've learned. But you've got to keep moving regardless of what kind of depression you have. Yeah. Well, and I, th I think what, uh, what Kathy's saying is very important. One way to think about it is that when someone is in a clinical depression, that good news or bad news doesn't matter, uh, it's unfortunately. Like a, it's like diabetes. You have a disease. It is different than being blue. Right. Blue has got nothing to do with being depressed. Blue is you're down, you can be down for three months, you can be down for four months. But when you have a disease like a diabetes, you've got it. You've got to deal with it the rest of your life. Doctor, what, what uh, I don't know, I, we can't, we'll never get exact percentages here, but uh, on the millions of people that deal with depression, and if there's 17 million that might be clinically depressed, there might be 50 million that are depressed down and where activity and engaging people and getting up and doing something would be beneficial. 
The others, as Rod and Kathy have said, it has no bearing if you do that because you're too far down for that. In that case, we're talking about therapy and medication. Is that right? Yes. When, when someone has what we refer to as a clinical depression and sort of a simple way of thinking about it, because it's not a simple thing, obviously, is that, uh, that depression involves multiple symptoms. The blues only involve one symptom, usually feeling bad. In the blues, time heals. With depression, it doesn't. One has to accept that medical or psychiatric treatment is needed, that of the 17 million people, and there may be more, who have clinical depression, less than half seek uh, psychiatric or medical treatment, less than half are diagnosed. The other half may go for unnecessary medical visits, uh, may go uh, undiagnosed, and may suffer the length of an illness which untreated goes anywhere from six to nine months and during that time several things can happen they can lose their job they can lose their loved ones they, uh, and they can affect their health and ultimately they can lose their life so one could say why not get treatment why not at least go get evaluated when you're asking before about anxiety attacks about what to do or what to do with depression the first thing you have to do before you can do anything is to figure out you know, what is causing it, certainly ruling out uh, a physical problem, whether it's medication. Uh, sometimes thyroid problems can affect both depression and anxiety. I'd like to say something that, that I, if I may. Please. Uh, one of the biggest things about depression that costs us millions of seconds of happiness in our life or possible is, is the shame people have and the misunderstanding of having something wrong with yourself. This applies to all diseases, but strangely enough to depression, which right away makes you think of the brain, which right away makes you think somebody is nuts. A lot of people are ashamed to talk about it, because the medieval perspective still exists that if this guy's depressed, he's a little bit crazy. Maybe he's crazy, and I don't know, but as I said in Newsweek, when they printed the thing, depression is a disease, and no one should be persecuted for having pain, and it is possible, because pain is part of living in the involvement of mankind. Forget your shame. You fight for yourself, and if you can't fight for yourself, then fight for whoever you love and who's next to you. Do not be ashamed <coughs> of being in pain. Well, that's the reason, beginning of this show, I wanted to tell a story, although mine was circumstantial and not as serious as what Rod and Kathy have have dealt with it just circumstantially you can get into a, a pit that uh, that you don't want to be in doctor how can you tell whether you're dealing with a chemical imbalance uh, or whether you're dealing with just circumstantial depression well first of all uh, cir circumstances can lead to a chemical imbalance sometimes chemical imbalances can result without quote a, a trigger as, as Kathy has mentioned but a way to think about it is sort of uh, re reviewing some of the things we've said that if someone notices that they have multiple symptoms that not only do they feel sad or down or blue but they feel bad they feel useless they feel worthless they begin to question their confidence in which their whole being is affected by their mood if they begin to entertain suicidal thoughts if they lose interest in things whatever interest someone has if they notice that it's an effort whether it's to be to exercise to listen to music to read whatever one's particular view is and that's why in, in understanding a depression one has to understand sort of who you are so that you know what in a sense uh, is the matter what has gone wrong but when the the entire body and being and fabric of oneself is affected one should think that that the brain is involved the issue of treatment treatment then can involve a combination as i said of both medication which corrects the chemical imbalance but also the psychotherapy which deals with the stresses the interpersonal relationships so that one can, can act in a sort of a proactive way to to reduce uh the stresses in one's life kathy, like kathy please comment. go ahead I'd like to make two comments. One is that the, the personality changes and changes in your life and your sleeping and your eating and your emotions and your sense of self that happen with depression can creep up on you so slowly that you don't really realize they're happening. Sometimes people around you will realize it before you do. The other is that sadness isn't always a part of depression. And when my doctor first said to me, I think you're suffering from depression, I said, no, it can't be depression because I'm not sad all the time. Um, I felt um, I felt overwhelmed by life. 
I felt um, despair, I felt hopelessness, I felt irritability, I felt confusion, but I didn't experience it as sadness. And so I, I always want to make the point that it doesn't necessarily feel like, feel like sadness. It can feel like hopelessness without there's feeling a, sad. There's another thing I'd like to say, which... Go ahead, 30 seconds, Rod. Well, I got 30 seconds. I can do the Bible in 30 seconds. I know you can. Well, anyway, what I'm trying to say is when I first got depressed, which was eight and a half years, it was, Irritability. I didn't realize. Somebody said, where's the phone? You said, over there. And that's a pattern after a couple of weeks. Irritability is one of the first signs you begin to realize besides loss of sleep or overeating or undereating. And uh, I discussed that with some experts and they said, you're quite right. The other point is... It's Ten the seconds. I'm sorry, we got these computer... I apologize, Rod. You're such a great actor. You could be irritable with me anytime you want. We have to go to... Thank you, everybody. Camille Giraldi coming up. We'll show a clip right now. Right now, I have 